Good morning, everybody. Can I welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to our time of worship this morning at Little Hill. It's the Lord's Day, and it's right that we meet together to worship God. He's created us, he's given us life, and as his people, we have new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. So can I welcome you and any who are joining us online this morning as well. Our prayer is that the Lord would be with us and bless us as we worship him together this morning. Often we begin our time of worship reading a psalm. We're going to do that this morning. Psalm 13. Psalm 13. It's a psalm of David. We don't often begin our times of worship with a psalm of lament. But it seemed appropriate this morning. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Things recently might have left us feeling shaken. But look what David goes on to write. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Well, we've read a psalm. We're going to sing another psalm that speaks of Whose care we are in as the Lord's people. It's number three in the supplement. Words that are very familiar to us. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's come with that trust and confidence in our God together this morning. Number three.
Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that this morning we can sing those words and know what it means to trust you. We can know what it means as Christians, as believers in Christ, to know the Lord is our shepherd. To know that Christ is the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. The shepherd who knows his sheep, who calls them all by name. And we come this morning and humble ourselves before you, our great God in heaven. Father, there are times in life when we, we feel perplexed, times when we feel confused, times when there seem to be unanswered questions with what happens in the world around us, what's going on in other parts of the world and what happens close to home. Father, sometimes we feel shaken by our foes. We feel bereft and lost. But we thank you that psalm we read earlier, that we can come to you this morning and say, but I will trust in your steadfast love, that your salvation you have made known to us in Christ. And we can find our strength, our help in you, our God, because you are our shepherd. You are the God who cares for us in such a wonderful way, the God who causes us to lie down in green pastures, the one who leads us beside the still waters, the God who daily restores our souls. We praise you and thank you that you lead us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake. And that even though we walk through the darkest valley, as we've just sung, even though, as the older translations put it, we go through the valley of the shadow of death, we can say, as we've just sung, we will not fear because you are with us. Your rod, your staff, they comfort us. How blessed to be comforted by God who is our shepherd. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you that we can sing, that we will trust in you alone and for that, that truth to be echoed throughout this room as we begin our time of worship. To know that your endless mercies follow us. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And as the believer, those known to the shepherd, we can say, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That your goodness will lead us home. So God, we worship you this morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow before you. We pray that you would accept our worship and our thanks. We pray that you might draw near to us and that you would do us good in our time together around your word this morning, that your precious truth would speak and that we would have ears to hear and that you would make yourself and your truth known and bring glory to your name. Our oh, God, how much we need your help in everything that we will do together. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, and show us Christ. This we ask in his precious name. Amen.
if you dare. <laughs> Done. There's plenty more. Look over here. That's it. Find a seat. Lovely. Right. Well, Trevor's been taking us through the life of David recently. And I don't know if you remember, one of the things that Trevor mentioned was that Saul, King Saul, who was very jealous of David, took a spear, didn't he? And what was David playing? Who can remember? The harp, that's right. That would have been very peaceful and relaxing for the king when he had these moods and these tempers. But what did Saul try and do? He picked up the spear and threw it. How many times did he try to pin David to the wall? Two times, twice. He tried to pin David to the wall in his rage and his jealousy and anger. Well, today's story is about another spear and Saul. You know, we're told after that, when Jonathan warned David that it was not safe for him to be in the king's palace and be in that area, David escaped. And we're told that Saul chased after him and pursued him with 3,000 of his best troops. And David had to hide. I think you would, and I would too, if we were being chased. We would hide for our lives. And that's what David did for many days and months. David was in hiding from King Saul, who was trying to harm him. And we're told one day that Saul came to a desert place nearby where David was. And he and his army stopped, because armies can't just travel non-stop. They're people too, and they have to stop and they have to rest, don't they? So they rested, and they had a camp by this road, and nearby was also a hill and some hillside. And they camped there for the night. Now, I need a Saul. Okay, you be Saul, you come here. Thanks, Saul. Here's your spear, good man. And I need a David. Come on, you be our David. And... Okay, we'll just have Saul and David for the moment, okay? Now, Saul went to sleep that night, okay? So, Saul, you're just going to have to lie there. If you, if you can get comfortable on that step, that would be great, okay? And Saul also took his spear with him that he had, and he stuck it in the ground near to where he was sleeping, okay? So, you've just got to kind of imagine that that's stuck in the ground next to his head, Okay? So off you go, you're asleep. And you know, God caused Saul's army and all the men to fall asleep. Is it, does it, does it look like he's in a deep sleep? Because we're told in the Bible, it was a deep sleep that came upon them. Really deep sleep. Are you comfortable there, Saul? Not very. Okay, well, you won't be there long. And David realized, hey, this army, they're asleep. Let's go and sneak into their army. Let's see if we can find Saul. But you didn't go alone. You decided to take um, somebody with you, one of your soldiers, called Abishai. So can you pick somebody to be Abishai? Okay. Oh, good choice. All right. Right, and you snuck into their army. I want you to sneak in. Be really quiet. Mind you, it's okay, because they're in a deep sleep anyway. They're not going to wake up. Oh, hold on a minute. Hold on there. All right, so we've got... So, eventually, David and his men found Saul fast asleep. And Abishai, what do you think you're going to tell David he should do? Yeah, this, is, this is the enemy. This is God's enemy. Okay? And he's trying to hunt David down and hurt David, God's chosen king. What are you going to do? What do you think you should do? Kill him. Kill him. Oof! Well, you know what? That's exactly what he said. He said, let's kill him. Let's finish him off now. Look, I, just, I could get his spear, and with one, we could kill him. Do you know what David said? You're ready, aren't you, Abishai? You know what David said? Stop. And you show her, stop. Don't, don't kill this man. God chose him as king. He's God's chosen king. He was anointed with oil, and he was chosen as king. Don't do this. God might have other plans, 
He might be killed in battle, but we are not to harm him. But what we can do, we can take his spear, and we can also take, maybe we'll swap, yeah? You carry that. We can take the water jug that was also next to him, and we'll take the spear, and we'll go back to our camp. Can you go over there, back to your camp? There we go, and stand there, right. Well, morning came. You can wake up now, Saul. Oh, you've had a long sleep, a deep sleep, and all your armies woken up. And it didn't take long before David was standing on a hill nearby. Now, David, you need to stand up high, and Abishai, you can join him. And can I take the spear as well, because you need that. And Saul, you can stand up as well. But sit, go down there. And on the hill was David with his men. And David was calling out to the guards, Oh, you didn't do a very good job last night. Me and one of my men managed to get into your camp. Oh, you're going to be in big trouble for guarding the king. And also... Where's your spear? And where's the water jug that was next to Saul? Well, when Saul heard this and realized it was David, he realized, oh, you know what? David could have harmed me in my sleep, but he didn't. And David went on to say, you know what? I'm just like a flea. How big is a flea? How big is a flea? Tiny. You are trying to hunt after somebody that's as small to you, O King Saul, as a flea. A tiny flea that you can barely see with your eye. I'm nothing to you. And why are you still trying to hurt me? I could have taken your life last night, but I didn't. Look. And then then he showed him, look, here's your spear. And this is the water jug that was next to your head. And then Saul realized, didn't he? He could have hurt me. He he was close enough to kill me, but he didn't. And Saul realized what a mistake he had made. He said, sorry. He actually said sorry to David, and he hoped that David would be blessed. And from that day on, Saul did not hunt David anymore or try to harm him. What a lesson that is for us children, isn't it, this morning from God's Word. And it teaches us something really important. If you want to just sit down for a minute, thank you, helpers. It teaches us something. Because David had a choice, didn't he? When when his um, servant Abishai said, look, let's kill him, he could have done that. But that wouldn't have been the right choice. Because David feared God, and David wanted to do the right thing. And you know, do you find sometimes in the playground, or at school, your friends can say to you, hey, look, teacher's not looking, or that person's not looking, go on, let's, you go over there and you say something nasty, or maybe it's knowing that you're, you're doing something you shouldn't be doing it. Does that happen? Sometimes it does, doesn't it? And our friends tell us to do things we shouldn't do. But we know what God said, don't we? We know what's the right thing to do. And do we sometimes have to say to that friend, stop, I don't want to do that. I don't think that's right. You know, God calls us to do that even at school, doesn't he? And make the right choices. Are we going to pop God first in those times and make sure we do the right thing too? Well, we're going to sing about that now and we need help to do that, don't we, all of us? When you wake up in the morning, talk to Jesus, ask him to help you through the day. Thank him for the food you eat and for the sun so bright. Thank him for protecting you while you're asleep at night, too. Yeah, I think Saul should have thanked God as well for protecting him through the night. Let's sing this together.
Thanks for that, James. And I uh, hope that spares out of the way before the children come back down again later on. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to sing a hymn that brings us to God's Word. It's 320 in Christian hymns. If you're using the books, Break Thou the Bread of Life, Dear Lord to me. We thank God for the food we eat. We've just sung that, but God's word is food for our souls, isn't it? It's what feeds us and helps us to grow. So let's come with thankfulness as we sing and pray before we come to God's word that he would break that bread of life to us this morning. Thank you. back in Luke's gospel this morning after having a break with Christmas and then uh, concentrating in the new year on the things that would lead us into our week of prayer. Luke chapter 7 and we're going to read verses 11 to 17. Just to catch you up where we got to last time we looked at Cornelius and we thought of what Luke records about his life this incident with his servant being healed Uh, healed uh, like being a live action sermon that the teaching the Lord Jesus had just given very clearly in in chapter 6 and about the 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 fruit of that being seen in people's lives was seen in this man Cornelius this man that Jesus marvels at his faith and then we move on from Capernaum we go 20 or so miles southwest towards the town of Nain and that's where we pick up our reading this morning. So Luke chapter 7, verse 11 to verse 17. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, 
and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Well, in God's providence, this is our text for this morning. Let's come to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your precious word, the bread of life. Lord, break it to us, open it up to us this morning. Feed our souls that Christ might be our all in all as we've just sung. So Lord, speak, we pray. Make us ready to hear. Help us to understand. Give the Holy Spirit to us, we pray, even right now as I speak and we listen. We humbly ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The title this morning is what the Lord Jesus says to this widow. Do not weep. Do not weep. One night while conducting an evangelistic meeting some years ago in the Salvation Army Citadel in Chicago, a man called Booth Tucker preached on the sympathy of Jesus. After his message, a man approached him and said, if your wife had just died like mine has, and your babies were crying for their mother who would never come back, you wouldn't be saying what you're saying. Tragically, a few days later, Tucker's wife was killed in a train crash. Her body was brought to Chicago and carried to the same citadel for the funeral. After the service, the bereaved preacher looked down into the silent face of his wife and then turned to those attending. The other day, he said, a man told me, I wouldn't speak of the sympathy of Jesus if my wife had just died. If that man is here, I want to tell him that Christ is sufficient. My heart is broken, but it has a song put there by Jesus. I want that man to know that Jesus Christ speaks comfort to me today. What a powerful testimony of the comfort of Christ. And our passage in Luke this morning, the narrative that we've just read, brings right in front of our eyes the comfort of Christ. As he approaches this town, there's a great procession coming out through the gate, heading towards the burial ground that was outside the town, uh, the, the town area. And at the head, walking behind the bier, and those who are carrying the body of this dead man is this dead man's mother, a widow. She's weeping. She's lost her only son. And as Jesus and the disciples come near and kind of meet this crowd as they're coming out, everybody stands still. And Jesus goes and touches the bier. And he tells this young man to awake. And he does. But he's already comforted the mother, telling her not to weep. He's seen her in her grief. And then he's done something only he could do. And the consequenting result is that the people who were there are amazed. Those who've gone with Jesus and those who were coming out expecting to witness a funeral, a burial. But the plans have changed. Jesus raises this man. That is what's in front of us. That's what Luke has recorded. A moment in history when Jesus, the Son of God, went to this town and did these things. And in God's goodness to us, he's given us this text to look at this morning. You see, Theophilus, who Luke was writing for, the, the first century Christian readers who would read this, were constantly faced with the reality of sorrow and death around them. And maybe this morning, we are still feeling quite raw from that too. But as that man said at the funeral of his wife, we can say to Jesus Christ still speaks comfort 
to us. And this passage shows us why. Three simple points this morning as we work through this text. Firstly, the sorrow. To look at the sorrow. Secondly, to consider the Savior. And then thirdly, the solution. The sorrow, the Savior, and the solution. So our first point, as we look at the sorrow of what's going on in this situation. The world then and now doesn't know what to do with sorrow or grief, does it? It tries to hide it. It tries to mask it. It tries to dress it up in something else. Because this world doesn't have an answer for it. Why was there sorrow in Nain? Well, this young man had died. Why was this woman so sorrowful? She was widowed. From that, we can tell quite clearly that she had already experienced the heartbreak and grief of bereavement. She was a widow. She had already lost someone dear to her and close to her. And so her sorrow was that pain of going through this experience again. Quite likely, her sorrow is compounded by the worry that she has. She has no husband. And now she has no son. She has no provision, no family to look after her. And think of how important children were to the people of Israel because it was through their children and the following generations that their inheritance was preserved. She as a family and she is the last remaining one. She has no husband and no son and so their inheritance in Israel dies with her. And in fact, we could say she has no future. And so she's weeping, quite literally mourning and lamenting. And she has every good reason to do that. And this has come about because of death. Death should not be a taboo. It is. Death is... Such a great source of our sorrow. Death brings deep pain and grief. It is such a serious consequence because it came about because of such a serious disobedience. People say that death is as natural as sleep, that because in their view the world evolved, death has already always been a part of history, that to die is as natural as going to sleep is. I'm not afraid of going to sleep. Not saying I'm afraid of death in that sense. But people aren't afraid of going to sleep, are they? In the same way that they are afraid of death. If death is as natural as sleeping, why aren't there broken-hearted mothers at bedtime once they've put the children down? It's not a time of mourning, it's a time of gladness sometimes, isn't it? Time to rest and relax. Why are people so afraid of death if it's as natural as people think it is? The reality is it's not natural. Death is unnatural. Death was not part of the world that God created in its perfect, very good state that we read of in Genesis. And so it is fearful, it is destructive, and it touches all of life. As you should expect because of what it is a consequence and a punishment for sin and rebellion against God. And it brings sorrow. It brings sorrow. And we experience that like this woman. And you know, let's just be real about these things for a moment. We grieve when loved ones die. We grieve differently. My experience of grief might be very different to yours. And that doesn't mean that I discount or despise yours or you should do mine. We, we're different people. We should acknowledge that. But because of what death is and because of the destruction it brings and the pain, grief is right and necessary and appropriate. And we as Christians shouldn't ignore that. We should lament more. We should lament more. Lamenting is biblical. I'm not telling you that so that you become 
melancholic all the time. But we need to be realistic. Did you know more than a third of the Psalms in Scripture are personal or corporate laments? More than a third are laments. Lamenting has its own book in the Bible. And the command to rejoice in the Lord does not mean that to lament is sinful, which sometimes we can think. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He lamented for that city. He didn't rejoice over it because he knew the judgment that was coming. Jesus lamented at the grave of Lazarus and wept. And if he is the sinless, perfect son of God, then we can see by his example that there are times when weeping and grief is right and appropriate. And we shouldn't ignore that and we shouldn't deny that. But saying that, as God's people, as those in Christ, we grieve with understanding. And more so, we grieve with hope. We grieve with hope. How can we do that? How can we grieve with hope? Because of our second point, the Savior. The Savior. Why is it that every week in all of our gatherings, why do we make so much of Jesus Christ? Why don't we focus on this or that and this current issue and and that? And yes, they come into what we talk about. Absolutely, we live in a real world. But why in everything do we make so much of Jesus Christ? Because who is there like him? Who deals with us in these situations like Jesus does? Let's look at what Jesus does. We've seen the widow and her grieving, but look at what we read about the Lord Jesus, verse 11, initially down to 13. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, do not weep. Jesus goes to Nain from Capernaum. There were other places he could have gone. Other towns around the Sea of Galilee he could have visited, but he goes to Nain. There were other things he could have been doing, but he goes to Nain. And we read that he draws near to the gate. Jesus doesn't see kind of this funeral procession come out and suddenly change course and think, let's find, a, let's find a way in the back. We don't want to interrupt them. We don't want to disturb them. Let's not get caught up in this. No, he keeps going. And you know, here we see something incredible going on because here death meets life head on. Death meets life head on. And Jesus, as he draws near to this crowd, he focuses on the widow. She's coming out with a considerable crowd. A great crowd has come with him and the disciples, but he focuses in on this one weeping woman. And it's lovely how Luke writes for us, the Lord saw her. The Lord saw her. And then he goes on to say he had compassion on her. And when Jesus sees her weeping, he's not critical. He's not put off. He has compassion on her. And he comforts her. Do not weep. Do not weep. Do you know, when we look at the Lord Jesus here in this narrative that Luke records for us and what's going on, in so many ways we see the reality of the word become flesh. You read Psalm 103 and how the Lord cares for his people how he remembers that we're just dust. Read Psalm 139 where David writes about everything that God knows about us and you kind of see this personified in the Lord Jesus Christ in this moment, that he knows this woman and what's going on and he draws near with compassion and care and comfort for her. And when we look at this, when we look at the Saviour and when we, when we consider these things that we have in front of us, here is what we learn that the Lord Jesus knows where he's needed. He could have gone anywhere in Galilee, but he knows he was needed at Nain. He knows where he's needed. 
And as well as that, he's not afraid of or uninterested in our need or avoiding our our pain and our hurt. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9 is such an encouraging scripture, isn't it? Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He's not afraid to draw near to his people when they're grieving and when they're hurting and when they have questions and when they're confused and when, like we read in that psalm at the beginning, we have questions and say, why, Lord? He's not afraid of our hurt and our pain and and how wonderful to read in Isaiah 53.3. He is a man of sorrows who is acquainted with grief. This is our saviour, a man of sorrows. And he treats each one of his people as individuals. He doesn't just deal with the crowds. He sees this one woman. And you know, in our need, he treats us as individuals. Isaiah 43, I've called you by your name. You are mine. The Lord tells us again and again, I know you. I know you. My sheep know my voice. I know them. I call them by name. The God of the universe, the Lord of all glory, the exalted reigning Christ knows every single one of you who belong to him this morning. And he sees and he knows what is happening in your life more than you do yourself. He understands what all your cells and atoms and molecules are doing, how all your enzymes are working in your gut, and how the neurons are firing in your brain as you're listening to me this morning. He sees you clearer than you could ever be seen ever. And he knows what's happening. And he knows how you're feeling. He knows what's on your mind, what's burdening your heart. He knows. And he's compassionate towards us. As the Lord has compassion, as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. He is compassionate towards us and he comforts us. He comforts us. When Paul's writing his second letter to the Corinthians, near the beginning of chapter one, he speaks of God being the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies, the comfort that we receive. And in verse five, He speaks of the abundance of our comfort in Christ. That Christ is the source of our comfort. He comforts us. Christian, this morning, you never face grief and sorrow alone. Sometimes it feels like that, doesn't it? Sometimes when these things happen that seem to rip the heart out of our world, like it happened for this widow, we can feel that we're just on our own. But as a Christian, you never face grief and sorrow alone. Because Christ, how wonderful, he draws near. He drew near to that widow and he saw her. He draws near to you and he sees you. And he has compassion on you and he comforts you. Do not weep. We have one who feels and understands our hurting. Oh, praise God, we don't worship an idol sat on a shelf at the front. Praise God, our God sees and hears and thinks and acts and moves and feels and loves and speaks to us. The sorrow, the saviour. Thirdly, the solution. The solution. Look at verse 14 to the end. Then he came and touched the bear and the bearer stood still and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all and they glorified God, saying a great prophet has arisen among his people. God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Jesus has a solution to the problem of death. Jesus has a solution to the problem of death. It's not to do what Mr. Disney did and freeze yourself and hope that some miracle cure is found for death later on in in the world's history. It's not to consume vast amounts of vitamins or to apply huge quantities of anti-aging cream. That is not the solution to death. They might have benefits. 
We appreciate the solution more when we understand the problem better. You see, death is a punishment for sin. There's no hiding from that. When God created the world perfect and he gave that command to Adam and Eve, he made it so very clear to them they weren't to eat the fruit of that tree because in the day that they ate of it, they would die. That their bodies would start to decay and age and death would come. But in that moment, they died spiritually to God and they were cut off from him. Death is a punishment for sin. And there's a solution needed that not only deals with the problem, the consequence which death is, but the cause of it. This world is cursed. It's under the curse of God. And so the solution that's needed needs to be something that that pays the penalty for the crime. That satisfies the justice and wrath of God who's been offended and angered by our sin. That provides the offering needed. And brings reconciliation between a God who is holy and a race that is sinful. And Jesus himself is the solution. Jesus himself is the solution. Paul writing to the Galatians in Galatians 3 tells us that Christ has broken, he's defeated the curse by becoming the curse for us. He's become the curse for us. Think of that curse. Pain and suffering. An anguish and sorrow. We've already said Jesus, the man of sorrows. In his death, he suffered pain and agony and anguish, which is because of the curse. Think of what God said to Adam about the curse. Thorns and thistles, the ground will grow to you, and you will toil and you will sweat. And Christ on the cross was crowned with the curse, crowned with thorns. And he sweat in that God in great drops of blood in the anguish that he was going through. And then the Lord, as he curses Adam, says that you will return to the dust. You will die because dust you are. To the dust you will return. And what do we read in Psalm 22 of Christ prophetically on the cross? You have laid me in the dust of death. Everything about the curse, Christ became. Christ bore. He is the solution and just look, look, just look at the narrative. It's there so clearly for us. He came up and he touched the beer. You know, that was so unusual. So unusual for a rabbi to come and touch anything with a dead body in because it would make them unclean. But you see, is Jesus going to become unclean? No. As Jesus touches the casket carrying this dead man, he won't be made unclean. The dead man's going to be made alive. In the same way that when Jesus touches a leper, he doesn't become unclean and and kind of cast out. The leper becomes clean. He said, young man, I say to you, arise. Literally, he's telling him, be woken up from the sleep of death. Be woken up from the sleep of death. Young man, I say to you, arise. And then Luke goes on to say, and the dead man sat up. Of course he did. Of course he did. Jesus had just told him to arise. And then this lovely line, Jesus gave him back to his mother. Jesus gave him back to his mother. Gave him back. Do you know, trying to translate that's tricky, but it means this simply. Returning something out of place back to its proper place. That young man didn't belong to death. He still belonged to his mom. And Jesus gave him back. It's just astounding, isn't it? What the Lord Jesus has done. How is he the solution? He's the solution because he's the creator of life. Genesis chapter 1, God breathed into Adam the breath of life and man became a living being. 1 John, sorry, not 1 John 4, John 1 4. In him was life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the creator of life. But as well as that, as we read the Gospels, we see that he is the one who has control over life and death. John chapter 11 at Lazarus' tomb, I am the resurrection and the life. I am, it's me. 
these words from John chapter 5. Where the Lord Jesus again speaks of life. John 5, 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Verse 26. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. He has control over life and death. And so he can say to someone who's dead, come back. Come out. Wake up. Whether it's Lazarus or Jairus' daughter or this man here. But more so and more gloriously, he's not only the creator of life, the one who controls life and death, he is the conqueror of death at the cross. He is the conqueror of death at the cross. When Peter's preaching on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, what does he say of the Lord Jesus Christ? He speaks of him having been delivered up according to God's plan, but he points at the people around him and says, you crucified him, he's dead Because you put him on a cross, but look what he says. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Glory to God. It was not possible for him to be held by it. He has conquered death. Here is how he is the solution. Life is his idea. (laughs) And he's beaten death. By becoming the curse for us. Do you know, back in John chapter 5, the Lord Jesus says something which helps us see the gospel in this so clearly. John 5, 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, there's different ways we can look at this and they're all true. Yes, like in Lazarus's case and this man's case the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and live that's what happened but there's a spiritual way in which Jesus is speaking here as well because he's saying that those who are dead in sin will hear the voice of the son of God and will live because they will find new life in Christ let me ask you this morning are you alive in Christ or are you dead in sin Because if you're still dead in sin, there's nothing you can do about it yourself. And let me be completely honest with you. If you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, death should frighten you. Death should make you tremble. Because hanging over you is an eternity of suffering and torment, and sorrow, and regret, and guilt, and shame. The judgment and condemnation for your sin is hanging over you. And you should be afraid. Why stay dead in your sin? Why refuse to come to Jesus? Oh, that you would come to Jesus. And know that you're alive in him. And that your sin is forgiven. You will find only in him that life and that forgiveness and that reconciliation and that cleansing that you need and nowhere else. There's that lovely old gospel hymn, Softly and Tenderly Jesus is Calling. Calling, O sinner, come home. Are you dead in sin? You need life in Christ. And do you know what we're going to do in a little while? Reminds us of the sacrifice and the love that Jesus left heaven and came to earth and gave his nails, his hands and his feet to nails, his back to a whip, his brow to thorns and that the wrath of God fell on him. Why will you stay dead in your sin? Come to Jesus. Do you know, we've thought of the sorrow, how death breaks our hearts, and it should. But we've looked at the Savior who draws near and comforts us, and the solution that he himself is the solution to the problem of death. And he's risen. He's alive. He's coming back one day. And In him we are safe and death cannot touch us. We have the answer in Christ. 
We still have to contend with physical death, but not spiritual death. For the Christian now, death brings us into the glorious presence of Jesus. And Christ has dealt with every single sin. And there is nothing left to pay. And so with what's grieved us recently, yes, we're heartbroken, but we don't despair. The writer to the Hebrews tells us that He tasted death for all of us. We see Jesus crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It goes on to say, since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Christ has beaten death. So as we come to the end of our time, this part of our service this morning, look at how Luke 11, that passage ends. They glorified God, saying, a great prophet has risen among us and God has visited his people. Let us too give God glory. Let us give God glory. God has visited us in Christ. And just think about how the Apostle Paul writes about that day that's coming for us. Because of our Savior, because of the solution that he has brought and made available to us. When that day comes, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written... God promised it long before. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but. We had a but as we started the service, didn't we? But I trust in your steadfast love. Here's another one, but. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, our conquering saviour has taken the sting out of death it grieves us but in Christ we are alive spiritually and we don't have to be afraid in that same sense anymore so even in grief even in sorrow, even in heartbreak as Paul goes on to write, beloved brothers and sisters be steadfast be immovable Always abound in the work of the Lord. Keep going, because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. Our last hymn, before we move into our time around the Lord's table, has this last verse. For my life, he bled and died. Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, He will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last.
Father, we thank you at your right hand is our Savior who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you that death is defeated. Christ has conquered. Thank you that that day will come when through faith in him we too will rise. Thank you that the sting of death has been drawn. Thank you that Christ has paid it all for us. And thank you for the help and comfort that is in times of sorrow. Lord, teach us to grieve as we should. Help us to lament when it's right. But also at the same time, because of Christ, knowing that we can still rejoice always because Christ is risen and he is our Lord. So hear our prayer. Be with us as we move into this time remembering Christ. For Jesus' sake, we ask these things. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.